Open your Bibles, if you please, to our, one of our texts for today. Leviticus chapter um, 19, verse 18. I will be reading from the, the English Standard Version all morning long today. All right, I wasn't prepared for that. There you go. I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> Live. <laughs> it's really, um, I, I tell you, it's, it's very different when you're facing a camera as when you're facing actual faces. And uh, it's, it's very different indeed. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and go to that text. Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know, good things happen when, uh, you know, when neighbors love on each other. I was preparing for the sermon today, and uh, I was researching, and, and uh, I was struck by, the, by the, one of the uh, sentences or the paragraphs that I read when it says that, you know, the scripture does not really say that we have to like our neighbors. Um, we do have to love on them, and there's a big difference. I want to tell you about our friends, uh, Fred and Clarice. Fred and Clarice lived in the corner lot on uh, Cambridge Street and off of Cambridge Street and Wilson. Um, Fred was a retired contractor and he built his own house. His wife, Clarice, stayed home and, and raised the children and also did the books. Um, Fred considered himself as the block mayor where we used to live in Orange. He was, so he said, pretty much the block mayor. He wasn't elected as the block mayor. He just made himself the block mayor by paying attention to people's needs, by checking up on people, and by helping people whenever he could. And he regularly would invite people over to his house uh, for meals, and we were beneficiaries of that throughout the six years we, were, we lived in our old house. Fred and Clarice were the vang vanguard of a number of good neighbors with which we were blessed when we lived in Orange from 2010 to, to 2016. I remember those good neighbors that we had back then and to this day, and we still stay in touch with a few of them. We remember, for example, the the, the house just to, our, to the right of our house, just next door, we called that house the White House. Not only because it was white, but also because it was actually the White House of the neighborhood. It was that beautiful. It was the best house in the neighborhood on our block. And um, uh, we remember <clears throat> that the name of the family uh, that lived in that house were the Hollies. Yes, um, the Hollies lived in the White House next door. And the Marthans, who lived across the street, had a flagpole in front of their house and a, a bright yellow bench that uh, uh, Mr. Marthans, Don, had, re had painted, uh, which his wife did not like at all. She thought it was too bright and called too much attention to everybody passing by. I remember our neighbors also across the street, the Ruelases with a basketball hoop over their garage. And remember Micah, Micah getting sucked in or, or included uh, in you know, all the basketball games that happened um, in front of their house. And uh, I remember too that the Ruelases, before we left, that the Ruelases gave Micah a, um, a, a bunch of books, the great classics, all hardbound, over 34 34 of them, which Micah read every single one of them, and then later on sold it to another person, to another family. Pretty good. And then I remember the diamonds, yes, and the wife's name is Cherish. Can you imagine a name, somebody by the name Cherish Diamond? Yes, we had a neighbor named Cherish Diamond and her husband Glenn and, and their two boys. They had a swimming, swim, swimming pool in their backyard, and my kids frequented their, their house and their swimming pool as well. They had a big dog by the name of Utah, a Malamute. 
uh, who was as strong as she was boisterous. I'll tell you more about her in a little bit. Fred Nelson came into our lives, welcomed us into our neighborhood with a, literally a Makita cordless drill in one hand and a wrench and a screwdriver in the other hand. That's how we met Fred. It was our move-in day at our new house in Orange. And it was December 2010. The door was wide open and suddenly there he was, like an angel out of the blue. And he knocks, the door was open, but he knocks anyway and he says, Hello neighbors, I'm Fred Nelson. I could have sworn he said Fred Rogers. I live three houses down the street. What can, I help, what can I do to help you move in today? That was how we met Fred for the very first time. And Julie says, hi, Fred, I'm Julie. Oh, yes, hi, I'm Mel. I was very frustrated trying to hook up our washer and dryer. I didn't know how to do it. And so, um, you know, um, <clears throat> Julie had pictures she also wanted me to hang. And so my list was getting longer as the day was progressing, and I was getting really frustrated. And Fred came just at the right time for me, and I put him to work that day. Can you help me, I said, uh, you know, just hook up my washer and dryer here. I, see, I seem to be, you know, having some problems here. And, and you know, as a person that, that, uh, that as, as a, co a contractor, former contractor himself, he knew exactly what to do, and he did it in a jiffy. It wasn't even fair. And so he said, sure, I got this. Go do something else. And I did. And he did. And a couple of hours later, when he was done, Fred had single-handedly welcomed us and introduced us to our new neighborhood. We had met our Fred Rogers. And then after two hours, off Fred went back to his home. And, but he, he, he promised, promised us... I will come back. And he did come back. As a matter of fact, he never did leave our lives. He and Clarice, they are still part of our lives to this day. Fred is a big reason, and Clarice as well, are one big reason why I, why I was able to finish my doctoral studies. You see, I had taken so too long finishing up <laughs> my studies, and, you know, I was in between two churches, and uh, the one church I was, I was in when um, I, you'd heard a little bit about this church, and it was a very tough one, and I simply could not get going. And, and so we moved to, another, to, the, to the next church, and I was running into a statutory uh, uh, time limit, seven years. And there was going to be no going back. If I missed this deadline, that was it. I was going to have to start over again. And I was cringing because the deadline was five months away. And I hadn't started writing. My seven-year statutory deadline was five months away. And so I was panicking, really. I, you know, I needed to do the research. I needed to implement the research at church. Well, I'd already done that. Now I needed to write about the research, and I needed to, you know, to, to make my find, finalize my findings about the research and, and everything. The church had already given me time off. That was fine. That was great. And I had every single elder of mine preaching every week for about five months. And they were very generous, very gracious in allowing me to do that. I had done all my courses but I needed a quiet place, a secluded place, a place where I could write. Well, I was frequenting Biola University at that time in La Mirada, which is about 15 minutes away from uh, the Fullerton Church, uh, you know, off, off the five. And you know, if you've been to Orange County and you see the five, how wide the, the five is, when you're in Orange County, as soon as you hit LA, it's a bottleneck. I mean, I-5 reduces to about this so, so wide, it seems like, and it takes you, what should take you 15 minutes, you know, from Fullerton uh, to La Mirada, usually takes you about 45 minutes to get there. And I simply, I was looking at the time, timeline and how much time I had left to finish, and I said, it's not good. I'm not going to be able to, to make this. I need a place where I could stay day in and day out and just 
crank it up and just write. And that place was nowhere to be found. We had our fifth wheel, and our fifth wheel was parked right in front of our house. But every time I went to the fifth wheel, my, my, my kids, who were little at that time, wanted daddy. They wanted to play with me, and they wanted to go with me up to the tr- uh, fifth wheel. And so that wasn't going to work. It was too close to the kids, and I was too close to the kids too. And they were at that age where, you know, they were so cute. I just wanted to spend time with them. That was way after the colic and all that stuff. I needed a place far enough to where the kids can see me and, and, and close enough for me to be home for lunch and supper. And with the deadline looming, I was desperate to find that place. So Julie and I went to Fred and Clarice, Fred Rogers and Clarice. And Fred said to me, well, how about parking your trailer in my driveway? It's out of sight and far enough from the kids. His driveway was on Cambridge, and my house is off of Wilson. So, you know, three houses down, you go this way, and you park, and you're there. And you're, you know, you've got your place. See if you, you can squeeze it in. And, and so, um, you know, I, we went to um, size it. And if I, I hadn't met Dave Crusoe back then yet, so I didn't know how badly I parked trailers. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, we sized, we sized the, 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 the place, and, you know, if, if I backed it up just right, um, I, it, it would fit, barely. And there was a, uh, you know, there was about a couple of feet extra uh, width, um, so that if I parked it just right, I could push the pop-outs just a little bit, so I'm not so, you know, it's not so cramped, there's some wiggle room inside. So I hitched the trailer one, one day, one, one afternoon, and circled around the block and um, drove down to uh, Fred's house, three houses down. And it was, a, it was a, a tighter spot than I realized. It's always the case when you're trying to back up a fifth wheel. It's very, very hard for me anyway. But it was just what I needed at that time. So what I did was, once I parked the, the, uh, the trailer, I started writing. I set up my place over there. It was very cramped. Uh, I, could, I could barely move inside. I couldn't really, you know, extend the pop-outs like I, I had wanted to. I did not park the trailer well enough. And, you know, I spent more time on this property than at my house for five months. And because of Fred and Roger's neighborliness, I finished my paper two days before the deadline. And you know, second only to the sacrifices of my wife and children, especially my wife, I credit Fred's kindness as one major reason I was able to finish my study. And I will always be grateful to the very day I die. Once again, you know, good things happen when neighbors love on each other. But we often think that when we love on our neighbors, that we are helping them. We benefit them. But what we often overlook is how loving our neighbors help us. We never talk about that, or at least we seldom talk about that. But our scripture today reminds us of this, of how we overlook this fact. It reminds us that when, oh, that's, by the way, that's, the, that's, that's them. Never mind the, me, but that's them. That's Clarice, our lovely, lovely neighbor. We'll, we love them to death. Can you tell? We love them to death. They're in North Carolina now. They moved uh, years ago before we moved out of o- uh, Orange County. But we still stay in touch, and we hope to, to see them again soon when this pandemic is over. But as I was saying, scripture, our scripture today and a bunch of others, we're, we're going to read a few others as well, 
reminds us of how we overlook the fact that when we love on our neighbors, we actually end up helping ourselves more than we help them. When we love on our neighbors, we remember who we are, where we are, and who we want to see. I want you to go back to Leviticus 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, verse 18 is one of those verses that had our Lord Jesus Christ not mentioned it in the Gospels, we would have scarcely known about it. We still struggle to find where it is. When Jesus tells us about the second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, we notice a reference note in our Bible, if your Bible has, is a reference Bible, and telling us where to go in the Old Testament. And so, you know, we struggle, we go there, we, um, and that's how we know about Leviticus 19, verse 18. So we turn the pages back in our Bible, and we wade across Leviticus, not stopping anywhere in Leviticus, because you see Leviticus is filled with stuff we don't understand, and, and so we zero in on this verse, not minding what's, what's around it. And in a way, not, not, not minding what's around Leviticus 19, verse 18, in a way is good, it's good. It actually helps us to keep the, this famous phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, front and center in our minds. If everything around it is blurred, at least we know that what this verse is telling us. So we, but when we read backwards in this chapter, we find something amazing, something quite extraordinary. We notice, for example, as we start making our way backwards one verse at a time in Leviticus chapter 19, that what God, you know, we notice what God is doing there. And what is he doing there? Well, what he's doing there is he's walking us through several scenarios uh, that are relevant to the day, to their day, to Moses' day. Um, several scenarios of loving action before he summarizes what those actions mean in verse 18. These are what we call part of what we call case laws in the, in the Old Testament. They are specific applications of eternal principles set in the context of Moses' day. The reason they often do not make sense to us today, and the reason why we sometimes wanna, would much rather you know, uh, skip over Leviticus when we're trying to read through our Bible is because those case laws are specific to their day. And if we want to understand them today, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to uh, uh, understand what the principles there are that, there, that, that the Lord is trying to apply specifically to their uh, case. If we are to make sense of them today, we must discover that principle and we find that principle in Leviticus 19, verse 18, when Jesus, well, well, Jesus later said, but God says here, love, you must love your neighbor as yourself. So then also we notice that, this, that there is a refrain in these verses. And that refrain is this phrase, I am the Lord, or I am the Lord, your God. When we get up to the top of the chapter or near the top of the chapter in Leviticus 19 verse 2, we find that the reason for God's command to love neighbor as ourselves is that this is who God is. Speak, he says, to the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He is holy and he wants us to be holy, and his holiness translates to practical actions of loving on others. This is who God is, and by extension, this is who we are. So, remember he says who you are. You are my people. I am your God. You are holy. I want you to be holy like me. And then he says, and this is what holiness means. It's not a badge of honor we wear. It's not a halo over our head that we see and maybe others don't. It isn't our knowledge of deep theology, even though I'm not knocking that either. 
It's good to know. It isn't our knowledge of deep theology at all. It isn't. It is quite simply loving our neighbors as ourselves. And with that, we can breathe a sigh of relief because not a single one of you need to go to seminary to be able to love your neighbor as yourself. It is, anything, it is something that all of us, even the tiniest one, even the youngest one of us, can learn rather quickly and implement in their lives. And this isn't just something we do because we've been told to do it. This is who we are. Loving on our neighbors is not incidental to our faith. It is at the heart of our faith. It defines who we are as a people and as individuals and our neighbors. And you know what? Our neighbors are strategically placed in relation to all of us in order to help us remember who we are. Our neighbors help us more than we help them. Or, we could say, if you don't yet know who you are, your neighbors will help you discover who you really are in Christ Jesus. This is how crucial our neighbors are to us. And we do ourselves harm if we fail to love on them. I read about this Asian American who lived in, uh, in, in uh, um, Brooklyn, New York, uh, he grew up in a very bad home, uh, you know, in all those uh, uh, gang-infested places there in, in, in that place, and he grew up in one of the Asian um, uh, gangs, gangs in, in, in that city to the point where he ended up in jail. He had almost killed a person, shot a person in the, in the back, and he ended up in jail, several years in jail. And one day, his mom visits him, in, there in, in, his, in, his, in prison. And his mom, seeing his condition, could not help but cry. And that's all she did. The entire visit, all the mom could do was cry in front of his son. And as the, this young man, is, who's been in prison for several years now, I think his name is China Mac. That's his not his real name. When his mom left, one of his neighbors in a near nearby cell, prison cell, who happened to be, you know, sweeping the floor next to his cell, started talking to him. He reached in and, and he said to him, I saw you on the visiting floor and I saw your mom. At the time, as the story says, he, was, he had 27 years in prison he says about this man who was talking to him. And then China Mac continues on with his story and he says, I remember when that happened to me, my mother had passed away since then and I just want you to know this doesn't have to define you. And this is the neighbor speaking now, China, uh, China Mac's neighbor. I just want you to know this doesn't have to define you. This doesn't have to be your last stop. You can turn this into more prison time or you can use this as a university. You have all the time in the world to learn about whatever you want to learn to fix whatever you want to fix. And China Max says, that was the day I discovered who I was. But now let's discover what happens when while keeping our eyes still firmly on our main text in Leviticus 19.18, we go down rather than up that chapter. We go down instead of up. We, what do we find? Well, we find more of the same thing. We find God patiently, patiently, painstakingly telling his people in Moses' day, this is, what, this is what love means. Love is an act. This is what it means in this context. This is what it means in that context. And so on and so forth. And he actually lists quite a bit, quite a bit of it there. So we go down the chapter rather than up, and we find God describing practical, more practical scenarios of, of, of what holiness means in everyday living. 
Then when we get to verses 33 and 34, we find something extraordinary. No short of being revolutionary. There's no equivalent to it in the teachings of, of, of any ancient culture of the day. There in those two verses, we find the concept of neighbor expanded, expanded, and the, and, and the concept of neighborliness pushed beyond the limits of our comfort zones and of our biases. There in verses 33 and 34, uh, what we find is something, not, it's nothing short of, of revolutionary, as I said, it is deeply rooted in the experience of God's people. It anticipates the New Testament vision of humanity without walls and divisions. Humanity is one big neighborhood, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Humanity as one big neighborhood around the person of Jesus Christ. It tells us to push the limits of our neighborliness by loving on those who are not like us, the aliens and the strangers among us. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 says, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him. You notice that. He just, he just expanded what neighbor means, not just to the sons of your people and the daughters of your people. You are now to love the neighbor that has arrived in your neighborhood from a very, a totally different place who is not, who are not like you. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. And this has the effect of keeping our feet firmly grounded, of helping us remember who we really are. It is very tempting to see ourselves according to the conventional wisdom here. We are the citizens of the land, and they are not the citizens of of the land. And I'm not here to push any political vision of any sort. I am just telling you what I find in the book. You can define it however you like, but this is what the book says. We are the citizens, they are not. But you know, this would be fine, except that God does not give us the leeway to think like this. How do we know that? Let's go back. Well, let's go forward, as a matter of fact. Just several verses, chapters, as a matter of fact, in Leviticus 25, to, to Leviticus 25. There in Leviticus 25, God throws, as it were, another monkey wrench on our understand, to our understanding of neighbor by telling us that we are not to think of our, of, of our neighbors as aliens and we as the owners of the land. Instead, we are to think of ourselves as aliens like they are. That is to say, we are to think of all of us as aliens in the land. This is really radical. Le Leviticus 25, verse 23. Let's, let's take a look at that text. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. For you are, not were, not were, you are. Strangers and sojourners with me, God says. Well, you say, well, this, this, this was in Leviticus, which means this was before they reached, this was before they reached the promised land. Well, let's keep reading a few other, a few other uh, uh, scripture. Let's read Psalm 39, verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you. A guest, like all my fathers before me. And even Solomon himself, at, the, at that, that, that day when he dedicated the temple of God, when God's people was already thriving in the promised land God had promised them, and to, we, to which he, he led them, he says these as a prayer to God. We are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. It is a radical departure from a 
all conventional understanding even in their day. And as I tell you, there's nothing comparing to this kind of understanding around that time of the writing of, of these passages in the ancient cultures surrounding Israel at that time. God has put our alien neighbors next to us to help us remember who we really are. And who are we? We are strangers in this land, passing through, on our way to the real promised land. We are all strangers in a land that is not our true home. Our true home is not where we are now. It's not where you live now. Our true home, yes, we make it our home in the meantime as best we can, but our home, but our house where we live today is not our neighbor, our true neighborhood. It is not our home. Our home is in heaven and in the earth made new. And by loving on our neighbors, we not only remember who we are, we also remember where we are going. Not just they, but us, all of us, including the stranger or alien that has moved into our neighborhoods. We help each other out. We try to make life here a little better by, by loving on each other. For we are all strangers passing by and, and guests, as it were, guests of the master who has prepared a home before us in heaven and in the earth made new where our true home is. We're all aliens here. The sooner, the sooner we see ourselves as such, the better we'll be. For then we can be free to help those who are struggling in our neighborhood and, and try to lift, the, lift each other up the way, the way we best know how. And this, is, this point keeps reverberating, uh, you know, all the way down to, to the, almost to the, very, what, to the, to the end of, of, of Scripture. We remember, for example, Hebrews 11. All of those, all of, you know, the, the, the heroes of faith, those that were all, you know, described by, by the writer of Hebrews as sojourners, as strangers, as aliens. And then he makes this summary statement about all of them and about all of us in Hebrews 11, verses 14 through 16. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And what's the name of that city? Jerusalem. But it's not Jerusalem here. It's the new Jerusalem, our future home, where we are all headed, every single one of us, including the alien that lives next door. Now, which leads us to the last thing that Leviticus 19.18 tells us. The ra this radical expansion and this radical redefinition of the neighbor and of neighborliness causes us to, to, to long to see the face of that one person who is making that city a home for us. We want to see him, and we want to see him now. And I'm referring, of course, to Jesus Christ. And we ask ourselves the question, how do we see Jesus Christ today? Short of seeing him when he comes again physically when we're face to face with our Lord. And of course, we cannot, we cannot wait to see that day come. When we will see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face when he appears in the clouds of glory and when he comes down to come and take us to himself and fulfill his promise when he, when he said in John 14, verse 1 and 3, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If, if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming back. 
Until then, we may see him. We may see him. And guess how we see him today? Guess how we see him today? Jesus Christ, um, answer is very crisp and clear and brings us full circle to our neighbors. Because Jesus Christ basically says to you and me, you want to see me today, you'll see me in the faces of your neighbors. Matthew 25, verses 43 to 45. Jesus says, I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to, the one, to, the least, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. That is very chilling. Indeed. Now let me go back to Fred, good old Fred. You know, when he saw my Facebook uh, post and I basically alerted him that I would be talking a lot about him today, he, he, he posted on my post and he says, well, do I get a chance to uh, review your manuscript before you preach it? Because you might be exaggerating here. And I said, well, and I teased him back and I said, well, well, Jesus Christ did it. Why couldn't I? It's called hyperbole. <laughs> um, but I'm not at all, uh, you know, I, I gave you Fred unvarnished. No exaggeration at all as Julie can testify, as my kids can testify. After I finished my research and finally graduated, you know, all the loads off my back and I, whew, I felt lighter than air, I tell you. <clears throat> Fred and I did something extraordinary in our neighborhood. We partnered up to help one of our neighbors, the family two houses down from us. You know, they had a beautiful, the one that had a beautiful uh, uh, Alaskan Malamute for a dog. Her name was uh, Utah. Well, Utah was always getting out. And we were always, we always end up, ended up dog sitting Utah in our backyard. And it's not very easy dog sitting when you have a dog that's very unruly and now and then would, would catapult herself through our sliding glass door. And one day I was, I was so stunned when I heard this Stood, and it was uh, Utah's face splattered on the, you know, on the sliding door, <laughs> trying to get inside the house. And I said, "One more of this, and he's she's going to shatter this glass." So I was getting desperate, and I saw once again, who to turn to, Fred. So Julie and I went to Fred and said, "Fred, we got to do something about about Utah here. We we need to do something. Maybe we should fix up there. Um, we need to see the problem." And so one day, I, um, when um, our neighbors had left for the day, I went to their house, not inside their house, but I paced back and forth in front of their house to see how this beautiful dog, Utah, was getting out. Um, Cherish said that she's getting out by, by jumping, uh, from a jump, jumping over uh, a block a fence, a wall, uh, yes, fence, and and. And I, and I went to see that, and that was, that's not what was happening. It was too high. She couldn't jump over it. It was about so, so high. And so I kept looking, and I kept observing uh, Utah, and I found out what the problem was. It was the gate. You see, Glenn did not have the time to fix his gate properly. Every time he Mickey Mouse it, Utah had already thought of a way to destroy it. And the next day, she would be out again. And we would babysit the dog again. And so Fred looked at it and says, well, here's what we need to do. And so we went to a Home Depot, bought all the, the, the stuff that we needed. And we decided to, that the following day, as soon as the, uh, our neighbors left the house, we would go and fix up their gate. And when the family came home that afternoon, they were stunned. 
because they saw that the gate had been fully refurbished. And then when we, they found out that it was for free, the husband became very, very insecure. But then the wife convinced the husband that the best way to say thank you, uh, to, the best way to accept grace is to say thank you. And she did tell him that, and he did. And so the riddle of Utah was finally solved. But then Fred did one more thing. He invited our neighbors to dinner, and he invited us with them as well. And so the three families spent an evening together. And to top it all off, we all spent, you know, an evening together as one, as, as, as neighbors. And we celebrated the end of the saga of Utah getting out. And I could have sworn, I'm not a swearing man, however, so I won't, that I saw Jesus' face. Maybe I saw it in Glenn's face that day when he sat at the table across from me doing his best to smile to Fred when he was really embarrassed to be there. Or maybe I saw it in the face of Cherish, the wife, who was so graceful and grateful for what had been done to them. Maybe it was in Fred's face or Clarice. Or maybe it was in Utah's face. Yeah, I think so. For Utah was our neighbor too. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, your God. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for teaching us how to love our neighbors as, as, as ourselves. And where we fail, we ask for your forgiveness and, ask us, and, and we ask you to, to help us to keep enlarging our vision of what it really means to love on our neighbor. And we thank you, oh God, that even if we may not realize or have not realized it, we thank you that our neighbors really do help us more than we realize. Help us to love on them as they love on us. And together fulfill your command. Love your neighbor as yourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.